All right. So, um, so hello, everybody. And I'm Jin Hao from UIUC. Today, I'm going to revisit the EVCAP supercomputers. And as some of you may know, this has been a topic that, that, that is discussed in the kernel mailing list for uh, several times. And I believe it, it would be nice to have a discussion here at LPC. So um, SysCom is the syscall interpositioning mechanism in Linux. It uh, restricts the set of syscalls for an application. And, um, and therefore, it enhances the syscall security for the application. Uh, SysCom has two modes. It has a restricted mode where it only allows read, write, exit, and seek return, and they kills the processes um, if other syscalls are, are used by it. But and apparently, the restricted mode is too strict and not really flexible. And therefore, uh, later, for the sake of flexibility, SICOM added a filter mode, which allows to use um, custom policies implemented in the classic BPF language. This means users can specify a, a custom set of a lot or just a lot syscalls for the application and also together with the actions to take to be taken when those syscalls are encountered. Second filter mode uses um, CVPFA's language. Uh, CVPFA is a simple, simple language. It has a small risk-like instruction set. It only allows forward jumps, which means uh, you can ensure that your program is always going to terminate. And then there is an instruction length limit also on the CVPF filters. All of these combined together makes CVPF uh, easy to verify against safety properties, um, which is really nice for SECOMF because, um, you know, apparently SECOMF is a uh, security sensitive context. So this uh, SECOMF CVPF filter mode, um, currently it's widely used in practice one of the largest group of users are those virtualization technologies and containers. We have, uh, for example, Docker and Kubernetes. They all support using Syscom to restrict application behavior. And then, um, as a Syscom to position mechanism, it is also um, widely used in sandboxes, as in System D and Android. So there are various other applications that are using SIRCOM just for the sake of uh, Cisco security, uh, like OpenSSH and web browsers like Firefox and Tor. But, you know, despite the uh, popularity of the, the CVPF filter mode, there are some fundamental limitations of uh, CVPF. So first, um, CVPF, it's stateless. Meaning, it will at, in SIRCOMP, it can only support static allow or deny list. And then the fact that there is a set limit in SIRCOMP, you know, when you have a um, complex policy that cannot fit into one one six one CPF filter, and then uh, you have to break your filter into multiple small filters, and um, this basically makes the uh, control flow implementation harder and also and chaining all the filters together incurs additional performance overhead. CBPF has the simple instruction set, and this means it will be not be able to use the advanced utilities like um, EVPF maps. And lastly, there is a programmability issue. Um, CBPF uh, can, does not have the two-chain support like EVPF. And so, for example, to write a uh, filter in CVPF, you have to be writing uh, you have to be writing CVPF instructions by hand, which is not really, you know, not too different from writing assembly by hand. And then to summarize, CVPF it, it cannot express complex Cisco policies, for example, uh, state based filtering. So, because of the limitation and um, the idea of porting EVPF to SECOM has been um, discussed in the Linux kernel mailing list. And uh, here, I, today I'm going to uh, revisit the EVPF SECOM filters to basically um, see how EVPF as the SECOM filter language can improve programmability and extensibility of Cisco security in Linux. So comparing to CVPF, EVPF um, provides a new level of programmability. It has a richer instruction set and more flexible control flow. 
And we now have EBPF map structures, which are uh, efficient storage primitives. We have EBPF helper functions, which allows a richer interaction for the EBPF program with the kernel. And then we have better two chain support uh, for EBPF. EBPF is supported as a backend, as we all know, in LVM. And this essentially means you can we can just write C code and then using Clown to compile it to EBPF. So what does this all mean for CIRCOM though? With a new instruction set, we are now able to express more advanced checking logics. And then since we have the, the map storage, we can now store states for the filters across filter runs. And then for using the, by using those kernel helper functions, the second filters can now have access to more kernel and process context for uh, Cisco filtering. And then as I mentioned, the mature two chains makes implementing those filters easier. So um, as I mentioned, there have been several previous efforts to, um, you know, and, and patches to port eBPF to CIRCONF. Here, um, we listed two of them. In the first patch, um, it has a CIRCONF program tab specifically for eBPF. And then on the CIRCONF side, it um, adds the support so that CIRCONF will um, allow using eBPF as its filter. However, uh, in this patch, no map support is implemented and there's not really a, you know, systematic security model. As for helpers, it only, it only support four helpers. And the, the, the second patch, which came out at roughly the same time, it, um, uh, it's largely incomplete. It only has an, a new eBPF filter mode in CIRCOM that loads and NACLOC allocates the filter. So um, given that there are a lot of discussions in the kernel mailing list, we actually took a look at um, the, the responses from the community and uh, we categorized the uh, responses into two main opinions about this issue. And the first, it, it concerns that um, there is not really a use cases for eBPF support in CERCOM. So um, what is the reason for, for adding eBPF support? CIRCOM shouldn't need it, and it only makes code more complex. I'd rather stick with CBPF until we have an overwhelming good reason to use eBPF as a native CIRCOM filter language. And then um, the second um, opinion concerns with the, um, the, the security problem. So this is the blocker as far as I'm concerned. There is no story for unprivileged eBPF. And even if there is a storage here, I found the rate of security related flaws in eBPF to be way too high for a sandboxing primitive to depend on. I just cannot bring myself to accept that level of risk for Silicon. So in my talk, I will be um, addressing both of the concerns here. So um, let's first take a look at the use cases. So in fact, we found a, a lot of use cases that can only be done in Silicon eBPF. Those include Cisco count limiting, enhanced tampering Cisco specialization, and Cisco flow integrity protection, checking Cisco sequence to implement, you know, intrusion detection system, and also potentially accelerating security checks. And those use cases have the, uh, you know, what, what those have in common is that they either require the state support from eBPF or the, the mature tool support. And there are many other and use cases that I would not have time to go over here. And in this talk, I will be focusing on the first three use cases. All right, so um, Cisco count limiting. This is actually a real world use case that, that is brought up by Andrea Agajeli, uh, the author of Cisco, who is now working at Red Hat. So um, basically, the con when the container runtime um, tries to start the application, it was first perform a, a series of setup steps before it, uh, it uh, finally exact into the target application. So we can take a look at the example run C code. So here uh, we're setting up our second filters. 
And then uh, we fix up the namespaces and also set the correct privilege. So usually this means dropping privileges um, for the um, target application. And finally, we exact into the target application. So the important thing to note here is that without the no new privileges attribute being set on the container runtime, circum is a privileged operation and then this basically means this um, circum step, which installs the circum filter, needs to be done before we drop the privileges in later in, in you know other setup steps. So in the later setups, namely those setup that um, um, deals with namespaces and privileges, at this point the circum filter has already went into effect, and then the syscalls for those setup steps must be allowed in the second filter. This is because a, once the syscall is blocked, it cannot be unblocked. So if we just block it in second in the previous step, then the container runtime is gonna break because it will not be able to set up the correct privilege and namespace. So this means that CPP filters will not be able to block those setup syscalls during application run. And then if the application is not supposed to be using those syscalls, I mean, under normal circumstances, and then those syscalls becomes the additional attack surface. And the solution is to actually use eVPF to implement a state-based policy. Here, I'm showing an example of how to use um, eVPF to implement a filter that only allow the active syscall once for the container runtime. What we do is that we use an eVPF map to store states. So here what we store is basically whether XF has been called. And then and if XF has not been called, then we know that the container runtime is calling it to, uh, to basically start the target application. And therefore uh, we just allow the syscall and then mark XF and mark XF as called. Otherwise, um, if, the, um, if we're seeing the XF again, then we know that, okay, the kind runtime has already started the target application. And that means that if it's coming from the actual application and the, the application, it's, it's not supposed to be using it. And in, therefore, we just reject the syscall. And uh, in this way, the additional attack surface is effectively eliminated. We also identified other advanced syscall policies that benefits from eBPF support. An example, it's um, temporal syscall specialization. Uh, the basic idea is that application can be divided into multiple phases where each phase exhibit different syscall uh, behavior. And then um, we just restrict different syscalls at different phases of, of an application. So um, take the web servers as an example, because those, uh, those applications can usually be divided into just two phases an initialization phase and the serving phase. And uh, in the initialization phase, it only, it only calls the init syscalls. And in the serving phase, it only calls the serving syscalls. Using CPPF will not be able to enforce the policy processly because the CPPF, the CPPF implementation installs a additional filter at the phase changing point. So basically it's here. And then block the as, uh, block the init set of syscalls, so that the serving phase is left with only the serving syscalls. And um, however, at the init phase, and uh, the serving syscalls uh, has to be allowed because, as I mentioned, once the syscall is blocked, you, you will not be able to unblock it. So, um, in this way, um, the serving syscall in the initialization phase becomes yet another additional attack surface. And then, you know, this is a simple example with just two phases. What, do we, what if we have an application that has, you know, potentially a lot of phases, then an average syscall that's gonna be used by later phases of the application has to be allowed in the earlier phases, uh, which means your, uh, your attack surface now grows much larger. So um, what we can do is that we can use an eBPF map to track the application phases. 
so that um, we just um, use different policies for different phases of the application. And then each phase will just get um, exactly the set of syscall it should be calling. And the last use case I'm, I want to discuss here is called syscall flow integrity protection or um, short, shortly SFIP. And um, this is a novel idea that complements uh, the control flow integrity with integrity for user to kernel transitions. So SFIP would extract the allowed syscall transitions in an application to construct a, what we call a syscall state machine. And then for example, here, in, from the application code, we might be able to know that um, the read syscall will only, uh, no, uh, sorry, the open syscall will only be followed by the read syscall. And then at the application runtime, we will enforce those transitions, which means if we're seeing a read after an open, we know, okay, then this is in the application code, it's good. But if we're seeing a write, we know that the application code will not have a write directly after an open, which means there's something wrong. So we just reject the syscall. In the original paper, the authors um, proposed the uh, implementation for extracting the syscall transitions and construct the syscall machine. And they also proposed the, the enforcement implementation in the kernel, which requires you to modify the kernel to get this thing to work. But if we're using eBPF, this, uh, the SFIP will just work out of the box. We can just construct the syscall state machine as an eBPF map, and then we can use syscall to uh, enforce the policy. So um, I hope at this point, I've already uh, convinced you that syscall eBPF um, is useful and it has a lot of um, use cases. Because of the time limit, I will not be able to go over all the use cases here, and, but I'm willing to um, you know, discuss about it after my talk. So now let's um, take a look at how can we make CCOM EVPF secure. Um, we believe that um, security is it's not obscure, but um, um, with systematic analysis and design, we can actually make CCOM EVPF secure. So my talk will um, discuss the security in uh, three aspects, uh, the security model, the support for eBPF set computers under privileged eBPF. And finally, uh, I want to talk about the potential IMA integration to enhance security. So our principle is to uh, reduce the security of SECOM eBPF to the security of SECOM and the eBPF subsystems. So in this way, the resulting implementation is as secure as the existing SECOM and eBPF. For SECOM, um, the security is, is ensured by, um, by uh, you know, requiring privileges for a filter installation. Uh, namely, this requires either you have CAPSYS admin or um, the known proofs attribute is set on the process. So that you, in, only in this way can you install a SECOM filter. And uh, the security of eBPF is achieved by you know, the internal verification and uh, the privileges for uh, program loading and helper accesses. In second eBPF, we just maintain all of these security enforcements. So let's take a closer look on how we reduce to eBPF security. And uh, for the verifier, um, we didn't touch it, so it's always kept the same. And then and for the privileges and for loading an eBPF program, this mostly concerns about the context access and the touch point. So this is already covered by the security of SECOM because um, SECOM eBPF, it uses the same context and the same attach point as SECOM CBPF. For the helpers, we're just keeping the same privilege requirement. This means basic helpers like map helpers are still unprivileged. And then um, tracing helpers, those from BPF tracing font proto will still require cap BPF and cap perf mount. For maps and eBPF, um, as far as I know, it currently does not have a privilege, requir privilege requirement for maps. 
but if uh, restricting map usage is desired, we actually added a um, new verifier hook to restrict the map usage. And in recent years, as we all know, uh, there have been several in instances of, you know, security related bugs in eBPF being discovered. This um, prompted the community to discourage unprivileged eBPF and moving to a privileged only uh, security model. So what we want to stress here is that second eBPF will still be useful under privileged eBPF. This is because um, a lot of virtualization applications, they just run as root by default. So um, they are still privileged enough to utilize the eBPF second filters. And in our implementation, we um, added support to allow users to optionally disable unprivileged eBPF filters based on the BPF unprivileged default off configuration in the kernel. And uh, if, um, you know, the unprivileged eBPF are disabled, then we're requiring the same privilege as the eBPF tracing program types. And this is because eBPF filters are similar to tracing programs in, in many ways. And for example, they share the, the common set of helpers. They can both changing the function return value and altering the process behavior. So um, the last aspect I want to discuss here, it's a, um, you know, a potential security support from IMAP. So if we can verify that an eBPF second filter comes from a trusted source, it will, be, it will always be secure to use it in, in the kernel. So this essentially turns the security problem into a trust problem. The Amazon um, set a subsystem in Linux, it checks the signatures of files and verifies whether it comes from a trusted source. So the idea will be implementing IMAS signature support for eBPF filters. And then the good news is that the AMA community, as far as I know, are very welcome to the eBPF signature support. And then for more about this, um, you can refer to KP's talk, which is just right before mine. All right, so um, let's take a quick look at our uh, APPF second filter support. Our patch is based on uh, Dylan's patch in 2018. We added a new program tab uh, in EBPF, which is um, specific for second. We keep the same attach point and contacts as the CPF filters. And then we implemented those verifier hooks that ensures the correct access to the context and also it's it was listed a, a set of helpers for the eBPF filters to use. And then for security model, as we discussed before, we're reducing to the security of SECOM and eBPF. I also want to um, show you how SECOM eBPF can be easily integrated into um, you know um, current container runtimes. So uh, the support is implemented in CRUN, which is a fast OCI config runtime, and it's a default runtime for Podman. And uh, we, we got our uh, support from our collaborator, Gaseppi, and from Red Hat. If you want to use um, CRUN and Podman with uh, EPPF filter, you can just use a command like this, which uses annotation to specify a second EPPF filter. So um, to conclude, um, you know, there had been a lot of discussions on porting eBPF to CIRCOM. So here we revisit the CIRCOM eBPF filters to see how uh, using eBPF in CIRCOM could significantly improve the programmability of system call security in Linux. Um, we identified several um, robot use cases that is um, that, that can only be uh, implemented using eBPF filters. And uh, we believe that um, the security of CIRCOM eBPF can be ensured um, with a well-defined security model. And then lastly, you are very welcome to check um, our code in our GitHub repo. So uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you. And any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Dylan. So I think this is super cool. The SecCom PBPF stuff has been going on. I have one question. You showed on one of the slides that there is these, this exec VE hook, and uh, this is where you stop program executions and you count them. 
is that like uh, uh, is that <laughs> I, I why, why not consider BPF LSM because you also need to have exec VE at here otherwise people will just use exec VE at to do the executions so this is the fundamental issue I have with seccom uh, but I do see the power that all container runtimes are already integrated with seccom so it can have better adoption if you have like seccom plus eBPF rather than just BPF LSM if you could contrast these two approaches, that would be nice as well. Oh, oh. Um, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with uh, the BPF LSM. Yeah, so, so the point was uh, when we were having discussions about BPF LSM, the idea was either we do seccom BPF privileged or we hook a layer below the syscall surface and we provide these policies at like the at below the syscall layer so that if one new syscall appears you will still catch these features otherwise the new syscall is just a gaping security hole that you forgot to attach a filter to so you would rather attach one layer below and have it and have as an LS, lsm hook so why do container runtimes not write a bpf lsm policy rather than using seccom bpf policy mm. yes i guess and another point is seccomp is still, even if you do eBPF, there's those pointers arguments that are fundamentally unsupportable. Right? Yeah. So what's the point of right. all that? Right. The next step is to port. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Um, so if you convert the seccomp to eBPF, the natural continuation of this work is let's support the pointer arguments, right? Which we cannot really support because of time of check, time of use. And it's all kind of, you get back to why not just do it like a layer below at LSM level. Okay. Okay. So, um, actually, okay. I have a question on the LSM. Is that, is that, is that like Cisco specific for BPN LSM? This is the biggest adoption challenge, right? Which LSM hook is called when uh, when what is called is used? The sec uh, the BPF LSM hook or the LSM hook for exec is called BPRM check security. Why? I don't know. Like because the structure is called Linux bin PRM. So the adoption story becomes complicated, and this is where I think seccom has the advantage in the sense that users interact with syscalls and they know about the syscalls really well so they want that's where they want to have a policy but that's not the right place to have a policy as the way it is implemented currently in the kernel because of talk to racism you will have a new syscall that could do the same thing so i, I think the real real benefit here is to improve the usability story of bpf lsm rather than like have something built on top of seccomp Okay, yeah, so I think I think that one of the concerns is, to, um, is because we, when we have a new system, we we'll expect the security policy, right? So, um, actually, uh, for SECOM, it is recommended to, you know, implement your uh, filter as a blacklist. So that uh, when, when there is a new syscall, it will not, you know, just magically escape your security policy. It will always be blocked. Yeah, for I think SecComp was originally originally designed just as a an attack surface reduction mechanism and grew quite a bit from there. And the real need for a lot of the container runtimes and other things is uh, much more like the mandatory access control that um, that the LSM layer provides. But there wasn't anything that could be installed by the regular user. It was you know everything up until about a year ago was had to be installed by the system owner not by some program you know you install chrome how do you get the the new policy you want installed into se linux or app armor or whatever um, landlock as an lsm is providing a closer uh, uh, confinement than um, than these other things and that's it's been designed from the perspective of being unprivileged um, and the sort of the standing problem that exists with the eBPF stuff is that is that privilege boundary. Even with BPF LSM, there's it's expected to be run privileged, and even even this seccomp eBPF is sort of presented as needing to be run privileged. But the real need is for uh, even unprivileged to run, uh, and and I think that that LSM layer gets you much closer to the confinement level that you want. 
Um, and Landlock is working on that right now. I don't know. I think that the, I, I think Landlock is super cool. Like it allows an application to protect itself, right? From a container manager perspective, where somebody is running at a privilege, where it can install policies, like as as this slide mentions, I feel that there is a there is a use case for the BPF LSM like policy to ship with the container itself, and if they need deep argument inspection, complicated policies, this could be implemented in BPF LSM. St Stanislav just mentioned that there is support for C group per C group based BPF LSM policies, which should which like fits right into the container ecosystem. But there is, I, I, I do agree that there is work for, in order for people to use BPF LSM, they need to understand what these hooks are. And I, for myself, find it hard sometimes to understand that. So any anything that we can do to map syscalls to various LSM hooks is the way this could work. SecComp, otherwise, you will run into the same issues we've been talking over and over again for the last X 10 years, I would say. So, Any other um, questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just yeah. saying, uh, could you be more clear about like what issue the second is having, like in the last ten years? So, like, if you if you read the discussions that have happened here, right? One is the the surface it, it attaches to; it is above. So you can you can solve that with a denialist. But the main issue that uh, Stanislav mentioned is talk to, right? the time of check, time of use race. So even if yes. you implement deep yes. argument inspection in SecCom, which you really want to, if you want to do complicated policies like these, that that's the next logical step you will end up with. And then you will realize, ah, I'm at the wrong surface in the kernel. And and you you don't want that. OK, I see okay. your point. I see your point. Yeah. All right. Oh, one more. Okay. Yeah, I think the 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 layer issue is LSM is going to be a better place to catch those things to avoid all the race conditions, and that's sort of understood. Um, and then the privilege issue is solved by Landlock, and then the mapping of hook to what does it mean is actually also solved by Landlock because it was the same complaint as like how do I expose this in a meaningful way. And so Landlock said, okay, here's the specific policy and what it means. And then internally that maps to the hooks and that's what has to evolve and not the policy language. Um, Landlock still needs a bunch more coverage. Um, it, it has a, a pretty narrow use case currently. Um, and I think that's the, the problem is there's a lot of these overlapping solutions that don't quite answer everything. And that's, that is frustrating, but I think that if we could get to the point where we could have something like unveil as you know, as done in the uh, by other operating systems, uh, it would be really nice, and we could actually use that for normal processes, for container runtimes, for everything. But um, right now, neither the LSM nor SecComp is really in a good place to do that. But I hope for. So I think the kind of use cases they, the person who was presenting mentioned, like this should be do doable with the BPF LSM, right? Exact ones, state machine transitions from one sys call to the other. This should all be doable with the BPF LSM. So I would encourage you to prototype that. Uh, one interesting thing you brought up in the slide was the signature stuff. Like if you move, if you say that only packages can ship with signed programs and the whole distro ships with the signature policy and those can be installed, maybe you can allow BPF programs, signed programs to be installed by a privileged installer process that has some security attribute that allows it to do that. Mm. Yeah, and, and I thought, and I thought once we have the single it also, uh, also um, can it potentially allow unplayers if we have second filters because we know that okay, those filters are coming from a trusted source. So IMA is protecting me from being, you know, attacked. Yep, nobody's going to write a speculative side channel gadget. And if you try to authorize one with BPF, then it's up to you to like live with the ramifications of that. So it, it does need some thought, careful thought, though. It's just the thought of unprivileged BBPF scares me, even with signature packing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Jinghao. Thank you. Thank you.